Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope you're having a lovely day. So yeah, I am in my daughter's room right now. That's why you see this giant um, like wall thingamajiggy. It's the galaxy. And uh, it seems like the only quiet place in my house right now is um, their room. So everyone seems to migrate into my room, no matter like how cool I try to make their rooms, they all end up coming into my room and hanging out in my space, which I totally let them too, so I don't mind it. But um, I wanted to come on here and talk to you guys about this, and I really am begging you guys, okay, to please um, stick with me through this message and listen to the whole thing. Um, the depth that, that I was able to receive from... Um, this study was was such a blessing to me, and I really, really, really <clears throat> want you to be blessed with it. Um, and, uh, you know, I've tried to do this video a few times, actually, probably like four or five times, and I tried to do it in a different way. I was trying to read it and um, and like break it down in a really technical way, but it wasn't working, and I really feel like the Lord just wanted wants me to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> and so here we go. Um, it is in regards to the parable of the minas, which is in Luke chapter 19. And if you don't know that parable, um, I'll give you a quick rundown. So there's a nobleman, right? And he is about to go away to receive a kingdom for himself. So he call, before he leaves, he calls 10 of his servants and he gives each of them one mina. And one mina is three, was three months worth of wages back then. And so... Um, he goes away and he leaves his servants um, among um, ci like citizens that don't want the nobleman to rule over them. And they even send like a delegation after him like they're So it's a hostile environment. And so um, when the when the nobleman returns, he calls to the servants to himself and um, he wants to them to give an account of what they've done. Um, well, what's wh what they've done with the minna or traded with the minna, right? <clears throat> he wants to know what they've done with it. And so um, the first one comes to him and says, you know, master, your minna has uh, produced 10 minutes. And so the master says, you know, great job or well done, right? Um, here's 10 cities to rule over. The second servant comes over and he says, you know, here's five, your master, your minna has produced five minutes. <clears throat> and again, the the master says, well done, you know, here's five cities to rule over. And the third, the third um, servant comes over to him and says, um, Lord, I, I covered your, your minnow with a handkerchief and he gives it back to him. Right. And he, and he says, I feared you. I know that you're a strict man or a stern man. I think it says Oster actually. In scripture and I had to look that up what that meant but um, he, he's, he said I know you're a strict man and he says you reap what you do not sow and um, and you you know now I'm gonna go grab my Bible really quick because I need to get this right hold on okay we back all right so he says um, and you collect you collect what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not sow okay and so that's when the master replies to this wicked servant and he says, um, out of your own mouth, I will judge you. Um, and so, <clears throat> and after that, you know, the master slays every single one of the, his enemies, the people that were against him, um, including the, the third servant. And so, you know, I, I wanted to... Okay, so we know that the nobleman represents Jesus, right? And Jesus has left each of us a minna. And what the minna represents is the message. It's the gospel, okay? And so um, each of the servants receive one minna. We all receive the same thing, the same amount. It's the message, okay? And I, I never noticed in this story or in this parable how the first two servants recognized that the power was not in themselves to increase the minna. The power was in the minna. Um, it says here that they they both came to the master and said, Lord, uh, master, your minna has, uh, it says, your minna. Oh, gosh, now I can't see it. Master, your minna has earned 10 minas. 
And then the second one says, Master, your minna has earned five minas. Okay, so both of the first two servants recognize and confess that it is not them who increased the minas. They didn't come up to the master and they weren't like, <clears throat> wow, you know, like I wanted to let you know I put it over here and I invested it over there and I was really careful not to be stupid with how I did it. And they didn't say anything about themselves. They acknowledged that the power was in the minna. <clears throat> and um, they, they clearly say that to the master, right? And so the master, so we have to think about Okay, the first one, right? He gets tenfold, basically. He's left with one minna, and then he is able to give his master back ten minas. Okay, so that go that means three months' wages is one minna. So he gives his master 30 months' wages. And his master, in return, gives him ten cities to rule over. For 30 months' wages? That's, I mean, that is just, it's just a depiction of how generous and good our God is and how we can't even fathom what it's going to be like when we meet him. And, you know, when he says you were, you know, you were faithful. Um, where does it say? Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over 10 cities. And that's in verse 17. Okay. So it's not a large burden that the Lord is asking us to, um, to, to carry. It's to share the minna. It's to believe in the minna and just share it and let the minna do the work. The minna will produce um, as long as you understand that it's the minna that produces and not you. And so it's the third servant that I wanted to key down on because it's just... It was so incredible how the Lord showed this to me. Okay, so the third servant comes up to him and he says, um, Master, here's your minna, which I have kept away in a handkerchief. And when I looked up that word handkerchief, okay, in the Greek it is pseudorion. It's uh, Strong's G4676 for those of you that want to look it up. And it's translated as handkerchief or napkin quite a bit. But the definition is a sweat cloth or towel for wiping the perspiration from the face or binding the face of a corpse, guys. That, that handkerchief that he wrapped the minna in represents his dead works, his righteousness, the righteousness of his flesh that he was trying to cover the minna with. And then it shows here, he doesn't even know God. This servant did not know the master. He, said, he sits here and he says, I know you were a strict man, okay? And he says, you collect what you did not deposit, and you reap what you did not sow. And that right there is to, the discernment in that passage right there to see that it is only the children of God who realize that it is Christ at work in us doing the work, and that it's not us at all, and that we have nothing to offer, okay? And so this servant is showing his view on, on the faith, which is that he is he's implying, if he's saying you... You collect what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not sow to the master. What is he implying then? He's implying that the master did not deposit it and the master did not sow it. So who did? He's saying he did. That servant is saying he's the one that, and I feared you because I know that you're this type of, you know, God, you're this type of Lord that's going to come back here and you're going to demand things from me. You're a strict man. And I was in fear of you. He has no idea who this master is, even though he just witnessed this master grant 10 cities and five cities to two servants who just handed him back some some interest on the minas they were given that produced itself, okay? And so it just shows you right there again, Jesus telling us out of his own mouth um, that the wickedness of that handkerchief, of that pseudarion, that 
it's it's a God is so specific with the words that He uses. That isn't just a regular napkin. The definition is something that is is for wiping the sweat off your brow, for binding the face of a corpse. This is something that's extreme. The depth to this word, to understanding this parable, is so important because now we understand it's the sweat off of His own brow that He covered that minnow with, that He covered the message with, and that is what He shared with the world. That is what he shared among this hostile, um, among these hostile citizens who already didn't want this nobleman to, to reign over them. And he was sharing a God who, who was strict and demanding and not the gracious God that he could witness right in front of him. Ooh, let me tell you, <clears throat> when I looked into the depth of that world, the depth of that word, just the handkerchief right there, I just couldn't, I just, I, I just, I could believe it, but I just love how the Lord constantly, you can read something a million times and then he'll show you a million times over the depths of how much he, he means his truth, how, how much the God, the, the power is in the gospel. The power is in Christ. It's in the message. It's in his word. And it is the power of the gospel that does the work. It's, it, there's nothing that we can add to, to anything that God is doing. The only thing we can do is acknowledge him. And um, that's all he asks from us is to be- acknowledge and believe. Um, so, and then it says here too how the master said to him, why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? He's like, why didn't you at least just trust in it yourself? You could have at least just trusted, put it in the bank of your heart and just trusted it in, in it yourself. And it would have gained interest, even if you had never, ever deposited it anywhere else, you could have just had it in your bank and it would have gained interest. Wow. The depths of the goodness of our God and how, how he wants the world to know so bad, how good he is and how gracious he is and how the the religious of this world and the people of this world who reject him, they see him as this awful God. And it's because of the antichrists out there that run around saying they know Jesus, but he's a demand. They they know God, but he's a demanding God. He's a strict God, and this is what he expects from us. It's it's um it's an awful teaching, and it's an awful view that I used to have on God too. And I thought he was angry with me that he was at least upset with me because I was constantly failing, and I had no idea how much grace um he has on me, and how much he loves me, and how he expects nothing from me. He knows like. Everything that I could offer in my own flesh is like nothing compared to what Christ has already done. And why, when I acknowledge that and when I turn to that and I look at that and I grow in my knowledge of that, that is how the message reproduces in my life. It's like I can't help but tell everybody about how good God is and what he's done for me. So... Um, With that, I pray you all are blessed by this message. I pray you understand that God has not left us with a heavy burden. Um, Just believe and trust in the message of the gospel. Preach it to yourself um, and uh, know that it's true. All right. I love you guys so much and you have a wonderful day. Bye.